Rogue Scientists and the Elephants in the Room, and that is going to be delivered by Dr. Joy John, and I would like you to give her a very, very warm welcome as she comes to the stage and tells us everything that you are going to find out in the next hour. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joy. Um, I'm a political sociologist with a first degree in medicine. Uh, both of my parents are geneticists. And actually, I come from this, um, I say, typical Chinese family where every single female in my extended family were sent to medical school. <laughs> and as you can imagine, there's a lot of pressure growing up in that family. And this is why I decided to switch to sociology, so that now my daytime job is literally researching how to regulate the rest of my family. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was only joking. Um, my research really focused just on one question, and I think it's a question that you care about as well. That is, how do we promote accountable science in an ideologically fragmented world? It's a pretty serious question. And to answer that question, I myself is not enough. And so this is why, to that end, I set up the Center for Global Science and Epistemic Justice at the University of Kent. We call ourselves GSEG um, for short, and our slogan is GSEG for better knowledge. And we do that through promoting inclusive social and policy debates across um, the globe. So my my work actually operates at two different levels. At one level, I'm a sociologist going out talking to scientists, clinicians, patients, and I want to understand what's going on. And after collecting all the data, I'm happy to retrieve to my study and become this armchair philosopher to think about how these um, um, make sense and how it contribute to our, understand of, our understanding of science as well as being human. But at, at the different level, I do actively uh, try to um, engage with research culture and try to actually shape it for the better. Uh, we, we go out and, and talk to regulators um, and different stakeholders. And I have to say, the second line of my research has become increasingly more important in the past decade. Why? Because well, I, I've been engaged in this field for almost 20 years, but increasingly it seems like it's just it's just becoming increasingly challenging to keep life science in line, especially the development of the avant-garde aspect. Because national policy, however well it's made, I mean, the UK, we have one of the um, more well-developed and established ethical as well as regulatory guidelines. But still, even for the UK, national policy often get caught off guard by news such as this and this and this, and this. And a lot of people say, as you can see, the right circles, a lot of people say, well, the, the rise of the global south, such as China and India, contribute to this. Well, I think there's some truth to it. And actually, in my recent book, I frame it as the elephant and dragon problem. And of course, elephant is often used to refer to India and dragon in China. But no, um, in this book, I actually use the two words metaphorically. That is, India and China, they're both um, are seen as a symbol for the new dragon in life sciences because of their formidable research powers. But they're also both the elephant in the room when we're talking about science governance. Because even when um, regulatory commitments were agreed upon with Western institutions, there's often this little doubt. That is, are they really going to do it? And also, let's be honest, both countries do have an image problem. And at least um, in terms of media framing, they're still seen often as a hotbed for fraudsters um, and um, rogue scientists. So is it someone would, a lot of people would say, is it because of the cultural difference that makes these countries um, epistemically disobedient? Oh, this is, this is a question I want to bring to you today, and this is why I want to deliver the talk today. That is, I think for QED, for this audience, a good science skeptic should not only be skeptical of science, that is, production of knowledge, but we should also be skeptical 
of science governance. That is how we make sense of these um, knowledge productions. And it's very similar to how, you know how science, what we see as evidence and where we look for it pretty much defines the conclusion or at least um, uh, set the premise of the conclusion we can draw. And very similarly, what I want to tell you today is in terms of science governance, what we see in all the scandals and what we take away from it also frames our responsive abilities. Um, so if you look at these scandals quite systematically, as I did um, <laughs> for, uh, um, for the past few years, you will find that actually a lot of the scandals, not, not all of them, but a lot of these cases, um, they're not culturally unique to India or to China or to Brazil. Um, they actually, because of the speed and scope of these countries' development, they actually have a magnifying glass effect of some of the shared challenges that we share everywhere in the world. And in fact, argu arguably, the reason China and India seem to be so problematic, so troublesome to ethicists and regulators around the world is because they pose questions that neither the West or anyone has answered to. And so in the next 30 or 35 minutes, I'm gonna give you two examples, and I want to walk through with you how we can see those cases differently, and perhaps we can have a different perspective of what we take away from those um, controversies or from these rogue scientists. But before I start, I have three points to make. One is that I'm proposing a different way of looking at these cases, but there's no way I'm trying to whitewash the irresponsible activities that's being involved. So all these cases are not models to follow, okay? Get that? And two, again, although I'm proposing a different way of looking at it, the point is not to downplay the harm all these controversies have done. In fact, I think you will very soon realize my real point is to underline that there are some significant harm or potential harm that would get overlooked unless we start to see these cases differently. And the third point I want to make is that they're rogues and they're rogues. And what I'm going to talk about are not those straightforward um, um, dishonest activities or just pseudoscience. It's not that. I'm, I'm actually talking about a very specific type of rogue scientists that e exploit the, the gray area of avant-garde science, and they present what I call the new wicked problem in governance. And you may be asking, what is this new wicked problem? Well, you know, I'm a very wicked person, so I'm going to save it um, for a bit. Okay, so I'll give you the first case. Ah, this picture, I think many of you um, may recognize it. This is 2018 in Hong Kong, when Chinese biophysicist J.K. He, sitting in the middle, uh, announced to the world that he has illegally produced the world's first uh, gene-edited um, twin girls. Um, and this is an announcement that's made ahead of this convention where we're supposed to discuss how um, or whether we should proceed with heritable genome editing, but he just went ahead and did it. And what he did was actually, um, he tapped into the social anxieties of HIV um, um, families in China, and he persuaded some families um, to participate in this trial um, so that um, in return, he promised them to produce healthy babies with um, their CCR5 gene knocked out, which means that um, if successful, these babies, in theory, will be immune from HIV for life and perhaps with a little bit enhanced um, cognitive ability as well. And, 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 and this practice is completely unethical for, for various reasons, and I'm only going to highlight two. One is that this has never been tried on humans. There's no clinical trial whatsoever. And two, this is unnecessary. 
well, at least from a clinical perspective, this is completely unnecessary. If you're an HIV couple, they're already very mature, very safe way for you to have healthy baby. The only difference this um, intervention made is that the baby will, in theory, be immune from HIV from birth. So their baby will never get HIV. That's the only difference, and it's only conditioned when it's successful. Anyway, I took this photo because when um, Jen Kui Hua made his announcement, I was actually at the conference and I was only four or five meters away um, from him and I, I witnessed this historical and quite troubling moment. And this case shocked the world, not because it was just uh, the world uh, first, but for two reasons. One, as I said, it is just completely ignored all ethical um, um, uh, norms at the time. And more importantly, given that this is, is a quite hierarchical and, and a quite elite circle of avant-garde science, no one has respect, uh, have, have expected that such a breakthrough came from a little-known biophysicist with little clinical training. And his home institution in China at the time was only seven years old. So this was a real shocker. No one expect that it will be obscure scientists that make this announcement. And of course, this, um, um, this case was quickly condemned by almost everyone within and outside of China. Um, but the real elephant in the room at the time was not so much Chinese values or Chinese ethics, because bear in mind, this was not permitted in China as well, and this is why this guy is now, or well, he, he, he has just been released, but he was uh, put in, in jail uh, quite quickly after that. The real elephant in the room at the time was among all the conference attendees from around the world. Everyone knows that regardless what, which policy pathways China or UK or the US would eventually decide to take, you know that someone, somewhere, is gonna do it again, right? So I really want you to take another look at this case. What should we read from it? Is it just another case that a Chinese scientist did it? Well, because this definitely feeds into the conventional media framing that, you know, well, of course, they're the, the hotbeds and this just reconfirmed um, China's reputation. I want you to really think through the question, who done it? Well, because it's Halloween weekend, I, I thought I can have some fun with my slides. And you will see this word a couple of times again. Because, you know, what really, um, um, troubled me in the aftermath of this announcement. It was not so much J.K. Hu himself, and it was, it was because, and it was actually not so much of this piece of news. That is, the Russian, a Russian biolo biologist said that he had actually always planned to do very similar research as what J.K. Hu has done, um, and he would definitely do so um, once he gets ethic approval. It's, it's not this um, news that um, really make me surprised or unsettled. It's actually this news. That is, um, is from Austin, Texas, where a programmer, Brian Bishop, at the time, only 29 years old, announced that, yay, we're, we're actually going to start a startup um, uh, focused on heritable human genome editing. And it's all funded by Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this, of course, echoes a concern that was observed in, in, in the Hong Kong conference. So a very thorny governing issue plaguing regulators around the world nowadays is that, well, um, national policies is still good at keeping professional scientists with public fundings in line. We're really struggling uh, to keep pace with um, the fast developing constellations of research programs that are, that are outside of conventional research institutions, that's outside of conventional responsibilities. So how, how do we deal with that? And, and this is where I, I think what we see in these case matters. Do you see this case as 
a Chinese problem? Or do you see this as a magnifying glass effect that can bring us or bring our attention to a bigger underlying problems? Because what I see in the J.K. Hook case, in the CRISPR baby case, is the fact that it highlights what we always, we've been knowing for quite a long time, that is, there's an increasing incongruence between the decision space of how we govern science, where we govern science, with the actual action space of where science happens. And we need to address that. And branding this scientist on the screen as rogue does not solve the problem. And the dialogue should not stop there. And this is where I think a different way of looking is really important. And to some extent, as I argue in the book, science is at large. And this is not a new problem. And science is at large is, is not simply as what I've just shown you, that is the practice of science is outside of institutions and is funded by private monies and all kind of different societal resources that are unconventional. It's not just about that. Science is at large also because a lot of uh, the categorical terms we associate with science, and thus a categorical responsibility is attached to those roles, cannot be taken for granted. I know it's just very mouthful. I'll give you an example. You will see what I mean. Again, this is a very old case. And I'm sure a lot of you have read about it because it was all over the news for a while. And this concerns um, an Indian example. It's a stem cell experimental therapy. It was, was all the rage for a while. Remember about, about 10 years ago? And, and, and the, our protagonist now is Dr. Jita Shroff. And um, she is um, an Indian-trained gynecologist who has gone through uh, uh, um, professional medical training and have worked for eight years in public hospitals until one day she decided to set up her own um, a private clinic. That's New Tech MetaWorld. Um, and what this um, clinic offer is, this is what I got from their website, um, so they use stem cell at the time, and actually even, even up to now, a lot of the applications have not been proven. It was still ex at the experimental um, uh, stage, but they offer these experimental therapies to a range of different um, conditions, from the incurable ones to simple things such as weight loss or lifestyle changes. But they brand themselves as the best um, medical centers in India, and they can show you that they follow all these GMP, GLP, GTP, GCP. I did, actually didn't know there was that many combinations. But it seems like procedurally, procedurally, they're as just as fine and dandy as any professional or um, legitimate clinics. But of course, what they offer is quite a, a different matter. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that's not verified and, and, and unable um, to be verified. Why? Because for a very long time, Jita Shroff actually started experimenting stem cell therapy at, towards the end of 1990s. And um, her rise to stardom is marked by a 2005 a uh, news conference where the wife of the then prime minister and the then uh, uh, health secretary, India, all attended. It just seemed to be very high profile and was um, endorsed by celebrity rather than scientists. And he, she claimed that at the time she already successfully cured 100 patients through his, her um, non-describable um, stem cell therapy. So that was 2005, but then actually up to 2015, there was no peer review publication um, that came out of um, her clinic. So while her patients, um, or at least some of her patients, uh, thought uh, she is a provider of miracle cure, um, for professional scientists, especially institutional scientists, she was just a quack because there's no peer review publications. And all of you know, right? Peer review publication is a cornerstone for good science. That's how you verify, right? I see people nodding. But here's one problem. There's one elephant in the room. That is, well, the professional scientists vehemently attacking uh, Jita Shroff, saying, you know, what you're doing is wrong, is not verifiable, is you're, you're, you're exploiting desperate patients. 
she didn't really care. Why? Because you may think that she's a scientist, but I'm not sure she thought herself as that way because she actually refused to publish up until 2015. Why? Because she wanted to protect her commercial secret. See, see how her logic is different? She doesn't see herself as a conventional scientist. So what, what would this incentive be for her to spend her time to write all these publications and write back to those nasty reviewer two comments, right? And, and for her, she was really happy to be outside. You may think she's a doctor in the traditional sense or a scientist, but she herself um, see herself as a businesswoman who happened to have quite a bit of a clinical skill and a bit of um, financial resource. So how do you deal with that? So I think Jita Shroff represents what I call, see, the, the new wicket problem. That is, we're now seeing new players that are outside the traditional colonies of expertise authorities, and, and they're, they're establishing rules on their own. They're practicing quite happy. They're quite happy to be in their own world. They're quite happy to be not recognized by the mainstream, yet their practice, um, all of these premature scientific advancement actually still cause a rippling effect around the world. That is, it could damage public confidence or credibility of a, of a line of research, and it could actually provide a very perverse um, incentive for nations to reconsider or speed up um, their regulatory debate. They, they nonetheless have a greater impact on every one of us. So this is why I think there's a real need for us to radically rethink how we make sense of these cases. Is it, is it a case of an Indian scientist going rogue, or is this something else? Um, I would like to think that this is another case where perhaps a different way of looking may give um, a different insight or inspirations of how we respond. For example, we often talk about anticipatory governance. We talk about this word for, for, for quite a number of years, and most of the time when we talk about it, it's about how we anticipate what's going to happen, you know, things that's going to happen, things are out there. But perhaps it's time for us to turn these, we should be anticipatory, but we should turn that anticipatory gauge to ourselves. That is, instead of thinking, um, um, when, when, you, when we um, devise regulations, thinking about who can do science, we should start thinking about who could do science. And we should design um, regulations with the anticipations that it can be easily adapted to new players and newcomers um, of these uh, research areas. And with that, I actually have another um, question for you. I want you to have another look at these two cases. Are these just the two cases of rogue scientists? Are they the one that done it? There's another elephant in the room. And I want you to think about hard about who done it. There's, a, there's, there's another very important actor in this. You know, when I read the Bitcoin um, news that I just showed you, I wasn't really surprised that when the news came out, uh, Brian Bishop said they already have uh, patients lined up. I wasn't surprised at all. Why? Because it's the same with J.K. Hood's um, CRISPR baby case. You know, the gravity of that case was not as simple as a mad scientist um, duping um, desperate patients. I, I wish it was that simple. But actually, the gravity of that case was that HIV couples in China were so stigmatized that they knowingly took on the risk because they thought that risk was worth taking compared to the other stigmas that they live on a daily basis. And, and that was the, the true sadness of that case. And, and in fact, for that CRISPR baby case, um, J.K. Hu, we were able to talk to one of the lab scientists um, that worked with him, and um, I was able to see the court appeal that written by the HIV patients that, was, um, that took part of the trial. And again, that trial itself is wrong. Um, the, 
there's no ambivalence about that. But still, when I read those court case um, appeals, um, I, I found it immensely sad because it just it, it documents how the individuals and how they make case of their reasoning of participating in these experiments, uh, knowing that this may not work, knowing that this this may not be uh, this be very risky, but comparing to all the stigmas they face, that very little hope that their children will never ever uh, be faced with the same stigma, meaning that they will definitely be, um, be immune from HIV, make them feel the risk was worth taking. And unfortunately, because I, I couldn't um, uh, get in touch with those individual patients, I'm not, I, don't, I, I don't really have the permission to share those letters with you, but it was, it was incredibly moving. And, um, and all of them were actually well-educated middle-class couples. And this is what Zhang Kuihe did that was actually quite ethical um, in, in his otherwise quite unethical design. That is, he intentionally chose well-educated middle-class um, participants rather than going to those HIV villages. And, and, and that makes his case even more troubling. And actually, this also makes me think of, of, of a lot of the discussions I had with fertility clinics um, here in the UK. That is, if you um, talk to those um, clinicians, a number of them would be quite happy to speed up the adoption of CRISPR heritable genome editing um, um, in their own research. And this is not because they don't care about ethics. And this is not because they don't know about the wider discussion that's happening. But it's often because they can think of a very specific case where that technology can make a huge difference. And, and, and I think this is a, is a very humanist of how we see technology. That is, we often talk about good and bad in the abstract. But a lot of times when, 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 when you ask people their views on technology, it's very contextualized. And what they see as necessary, as in the HIV couple case, um, or as good as in the fertility um, clinician's case, are very contextualized. There, there are specific conditions that's attached to it. So I always tell um, policymakers that even when democratic um, um, decisions are not possible, it is really worthwhile to listen to these human stories behind these um, decisions. Because the point of policy is not to define what good is for us. The point of policy is really to define the condition of those good and how we deliver those good. And so we, we really need to understand um, these policies. And one of the key challenge for a uh, policymaker nowadays is not the incertitude that's evoked by scientific uh, development. It's, it's not about risk, or not just about risk anymore. It's rather about the multitude of possibilities of these scientific technologies have um, uh, presented to us. And how do we deal with the, the multiplicity of um, the social resource as well as incentives that's lying underneath all these scientific advancement? Well, I do have, I do have, um, a solution, and summarizing one word, is called decolonization. Well, I hope at least some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, not again, that D word. <laughs> because, because I feel you, because this is a word that has been used almost everywhere. And, and I, some, I, I sometimes feel this is perhaps the most misused word because it's used as a, as a labeling uh, technique to invigorate or rebranding uh, some of the inclusive diversity practices already ongoing. And, and to be honest, um, um, one of my PhD students the other day asked me, everyone is talking about decolonizing governance, but what does it mean? This is what a PhD student asked me. And my 12-year-old nephew actually said, oh, decolonization. Is it just about being nice to people? I, you know, I just feel like kids, they're so perceptive, but so cruel. And it, sometimes it really boils down to that. It just seems like decolonization is about being nice. But no, the decolonization I'm, I'm um, advocating, and I hope you will adopt today, now, is actually epistemic 
project. That is, it is actually a project to change our way of seeing things so we can step out of the colonies of habitual thinking, to step out of our epistemic bias so as to have a clearer picture of what's going on in the world. It is way beyond how to deal with the, uh, the imperial, imperialist legacies. Rather, it is about how can we have a more um, informed sense of what's happening at present so as to strategize for the future. So decolonization is something that, um, that a good science uh, skeptics should have. And I have, um, also I, I do have specific tools for you to decolonize your way of thinking. And in my book, I summarize into three themes, time, place, people. Again, I know it sounds all very abstract and grand, and there's some specificity to it start with time. You know, good science is always about time, from culturing your bacteria um, to time your research project. But how we perceive time can also be a hindrance for us to see the pathway to good or effective governance. What do I mean by that? Well, for a very long time, we often have these, um, or we, we embrace this underlying linear way of seeing progress. Um, we, we, we often think that the global south, the late developing country, they're catching up to us. And, and the whole point of global governance is bring everyone to the, time, to the same time zone. That is only if they can behave more like us. Yet only if we can harmonize um, global governance or global norms. I think it's time to give up on that. Because a real elephant in the room is that um, we're just all contemporaneous, faced with very similar social technical challenges and in the absence of foresight. No one is catching up with anyone else. And more importantly, um, I don't like the word catching up because it just implies a linear, singular progress. What if it's not about catching up anymore? What if it's about different people using the same technology and you know, go off into different directions. And in that sense, it's not about bringing everyone in line anymore. Uh, our policy discussions or how we think about research culture should be focused on how to coordinate these um, um, different directions, how to bring them together and, to, and so as to make them think about the contingency and conditionality of their scientific ambitions rather than um, practicing in a uniform way. And another uh, tool I want to offer you is to think about place and people. And of course, people make a space a place. So it's people that make a space. So I'm just going to combine them into one liner. That is, we need to really think about the peopling of technology. Because another elephant in the room is that I think uh, or I hope I've convinced you with the example I've just given that we actually have little idea of how science is really practiced in the world now. Things are changing so fast and, and, and different money and material seem to kind of um, merge into different marriages as we speak and it's quite different from how we imagine it. And there is, as I said, an increasing incongruence between how we imagine science is practiced and how science is really practiced. So we need to focus on the peopling of te technology. We need to ask, start asking the naive question again. And there are three layers to it. One is peopling of technology as the understanding, the strategization and materialization of all the human ambitions between science. Uh, put it simply, who's doing what, funded by what, or by whom? And who benefits and who excludes? And, and, and what are the human gatherings and interactions behind all these scientific advancements? This is one thing we need to ask. And two, we really, peopling of technology means that we really need to understand um, the human aspirations and desires behind um, technology. We often talk about humanizing science. But you know, 
for those HIV couples, how, how they decide to take the trial. That's humanizing science in action, but those human stories often get sidelined or, or get ignored when we talk about policies. And if you ignore that, you, you will actually give room for those rogue scientists, for those experimental clinics, and, and it makes them harder to crack down. Um, why do we give them that um, opportunity? Why can't we take a different approach, understand different stakeholders, that's including patients, doctors, clinicians, understand how they see scientific possibilities as vehicles for their own self-fulfillment, and incorporate those reasonings into um, the development of um, new science policies. And the l final level of peopling of technology is to understand that, of course, we people, we, we're changed by technology, and technology change our perception of rights, responsibilities, and also it change our perception of what plausible um, uh, um, demands and what reasonable welfare is. And, and so you cannot really treat um, special interest groups or the general public's perspective as static. You, you, we have to follow it and we have to engage with um, all these dialogues. So in a way, we, we need to see how technology is peopled, how we make it happen, and how it impacts our lives. So in summary, I really think a different way of seeing those rogue scientists um, needs a little bit of decolonization. And once we step out of our colonies of epistemic bias, we may be able to see those elephants and confront them. Um, and I always say to people, um, decolonization, it is about um, go beyond the epistemic bias as, um, um, uh, as a result of power imbalance. And it is in our power to brand these deviants as rogue. We can simply see that, say that, you know, these are dealt with, um, these, these are not mainstream, these are not to be followed, just black box it. It is in our power to do so, but I do think it is in our interest um, to see further and deeper to understand the human reasonings behind these contentions. And just one last thing I wanna say is, you may be asking me, wh why are you telling us this. Why are you telling us all these elephants um, and, and all these rogue scientists? I, I guess one of the simple things is that um, I want, after today, um, whenever you hear the, the term rogue, just tell yourself you need to be skeptical of that term again. And when media to tell you something has been branded as rogue, that's not the end of a conversation. It's not a solution. It's not problem solved. That is actually a signifier of the starting point of a discussion. We need to unpack why is it rogue, how has it happened, and um, that just opened up a different way of seeing it. And hopefully it will enable us to uh, respond better. Thank you. <laughs>